Welcome to Understanding the Word of God. This channel is dedicated to understanding the Bible one verse at a time. Today's Bible verse is Matthew 22, verse 14. Let's begin with looking up the verse, and we're going to use the website called Bible Hub. And what's awesome about Bible Hub is it gives you many translations here, and you can see how the word is translated into English from the Greek. It says, For many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. So there's a lot of many are called. It's like the second half of the verse is few are chosen. It seems like it's always translated chosen. But there is a couple times where called is translated as invited. We are, uh, we're used to the word invited. I spec back in the, in the days, they referred to it as calling back when the Bible was first translated into English. So let's see what this verse says in context. So Matthew 22, we're concentrating on verse 14, but let's read starting in verse 1 of Matthew 22 and see what else is uh, showing up here in the verses. And Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused. Then he sent more of his servants and said, to tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. And the king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. So there's a bunch of stuff happening with the first group that was invited. Have you ever tried to go and invite someone to accept Jesus into their heart? Or you told them about your experience of receiving Jesus into your heart and how how that transformation began and, and how excited you were about it and you and you told some told some people and and they uh they were not happy with you. They they might have thought you were crazy they might have thought that you just got some kind of religious bug and you'll get over it, but there was a, <clears throat> they didn't uh, they didn't really receive you warmly. It looks like uh, in this parable there was a group of people that experienced similar <clears throat> similar conditions when they went and tried to tell. So then let's go down to the next part. It says and then his. And then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servant went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So here's the second group of people that were involved, that were invited to this wedding banquet. It was the bad as well as the good. That's, uh, that's interesting because I know when I came to receive Yeshua as my Savior, I did not, I was not, uh, I wouldn't, cons I might have thought of myself as good, but I wasn't living a good life. I was living a total self-centered life, just uh, doing whatever my natural desire wanted to do with the society's bounds put on it to, to rein in some of the, the bad behavior that I was expressing. So we got two people, we got the first ones that were rejected and that the people that preached to them had gotten killed. We got the second group of people that are being invited. They're just the, anybody, anybody out there, the bad as well as the good. So if you're bad, you you have an opportunity to be invited. If you're, uh, if you're good, you have an opportunity to be invited. So let's see what happens next. But then the king came to see the guest. He noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in here without any wedding clothes, friend? Look, he actually called him friend. It, uh, that is just, that's just crazy. I, I don't know. I just, uh, some things stick out when you read it. And it's like, how does this fit into this story? I mean, I, I 
if they're there without wedding clothes, obviously you you didn't invite them or if you invited them, then they didn't bother to get ready. So, I mean, it's actually somebody that you know, say you say you were getting married or your or your daughter or son's getting married and, and you invite some friends and they show up in their, their raggedy clothes and uh, <clears throat> and they're your friend, but for some reason they decided that they didn't feel it that the wedding was important enough for them to get ready and to get dressed up for it. They just came in their, in their uh, scrubby clothes. And the man was speechless. He didn't even, have an, didn't even have an excuse. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him out into darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that's a pretty severe punishment. So this must be speaking more than just what we would think of as a regular wedding it has to be something that's doing with uh, much more intense issues. And then we come down to our verse for the that we're studying at is for many are invited but few are chosen. So to be invited is one thing, and it looks like the invitation will go to the good or the bad. But there's also something that's important is that we need to get clothed properly. So how do we how do we become chosen? Obviously being invited is not difficult at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, hey man, anybody, come on over, no problem. But being chosen is where the challenge comes in. So in my Christianity, in my walk with God, how in the world am I gonna get chosen? How am I gonna be part of the few? A, a verse comes to my mind that, uh, Paul said was to make your election sure. So let's go look up that verse and see how that fits into this parable. So it was actually Peter who made that statement. So let's look up 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. He's saying, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And so we have these different translations here. I'm just going to stick with uh, this first one here, and let's look at it more in context. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. So let's start at verse 3 here. Confirm one's calling and election. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Though these have been given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desires. So this first paragraph here is addressing that it's his divine power that he has given us everything we need so that we may escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So maybe that servant that was in the wedding banquet that wasn't dressed, he didn't bother to deal with the corruption in his life. He didn't, he didn't choose to trust God and, and trust in His divine power, giving Him everything He needed through our knowledge of Jesus, who called us by His own glory and goodness. So He's given us very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature. So He apparently did not dress Himself in the divine nature. That is something that from what I understand from the scriptures, is something that doesn't happen when you receive the invitation. In other words, you're, you're called and you receive the invitation. It's like, this is fantastic. I'm going to get to go to heaven. My, my life is going to be now perfect. But then there's, a, there's an aspect of reality that comes in, is that there's the world, there's corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And so the world is corrupted by the evil desires of people. And, and to say that the world's not corrupted is, is to say that all the, the murders, all the, all the stuff that's done to other people, 
the just pure corruption. It's 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 everywhere, and it's caused by evil desires. So evil desires is something that has to be purged out of us if we want to be dressed in our wedding clothes. So then Peter goes on to explain. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measures, then you will, it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Now, if you remember in, in our last Bible study, we talked about having the, the, the natural man put to death. For if we follow Christ, we have to take up that cross. And so what happens is if we are not walking, if, if we're not adding to our faith goodness and knowledge and the knowledge, self-control and self-control and perseverance, Perseverance is, an, is a word for, for patience, godliness, mutual affection, mutual affect, affection and love, possessing these qualities, and they're not increasing in our lives. We're actually nearsighted and we're blind. And we don't even remember that we've been cleansed from our past sins. We're going back to, as, as the proverb says, a dog goes back to his vomit. In other words, we, we've ingested the world before we came to know Jesus as our, as our Lord and Savior, and we ate of the world at that time. And we ingested of the world. We, we participated in the world. We, we ran with the corruption in the world. But then when we, we received that invitation, we got all joyful. We got all happy. We got, oh man, this is great. This is great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of this, this filth that I'm living in. But the, but the situation comes up to where we're not at this, that point. We're still in this natural body. And this natural body has to be dealt with. And the way it's dealt with is that we have to reckon ourselves dead to sin. And then as we do that, we, we then learn how to be, how to, how to have faith and, and goodness. And then we, we have the knowledge, we, we, we gain the knowledge of God. We have self-control. We have perseverance. And all these things come from the divine power working in us. And then verse 10, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is what happened to the guy that was at the wedding feast that, didn't, that had his filthy rags on. He, he was not received. And here it says, if we make every effort to do these things, then we're going to make our calling and our election sure. This is this is so awesome. So it isn't Christianity isn't something you just magically get. It's something that you you learn to walk in. Uh, if you're not a, a kind person and you're narcissistic, it it takes a lot of uh, denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus to be able to get to that place where the narcissism in your life is is put down. It, it needs to have the cross. It, the, that selfish attitude needs to be nailed to the cross. And and it, it can't be done through just our own our own power. If if it was done through our own power, then why do we even need a savior? We need a savior because we realize that the sin in our life we're incapable of hitting the target. We're incapable of, of doing that, which is right. So how do we deal with the natural person that, that doesn't within us, our sin nature within us, and how do we transition to uh, faith and goodness and all the things called out here in, in verse 5 through, through 9? And how do we not forget we've been cleansed from our past sins? There's a there's a key that I found very important because it also says that behold I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. And it's in Luke chapter 6 verse 37. It says do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be 
forgiven. So in, in this verse is the information that we can receive that will actually bring us to the place of not forgetting, as we saw in, in Peter, forgetting that we were cleansed forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. If we have unforgiveness in us, if we're holding anything against anybody for any reason, we will be nearsighted and blind. There is, there is no way to get past this. And granted, there are some things that are very difficult to forgive. Uh, when our personal body has been violated through a form of abuse is 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 tremendously devastating and it but it's the if we hold on to that bitterness if we if we do not forgive it'll turn into bitterness and when bitterness grows within us we become more and more despondent we become more and more attacking uh, I before I became a Christian, I didn't know how to deal with people that uh, offended me. So I just got angry and created a, a list in my head of all the things where I've been wronged. And it, it took me a long time to walk through this verse, but it is hugely important. And if we read the whole story leading up to verse 37... Where it says in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, But you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, bless those that curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other one also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to them whoever asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others that you would have them do to you. This was spoken a lot to in the days of, of uh, the Roman rule to the Jewish people. They, if a soldier came by and he wanted something, he just he just took it. And uh, so there was a they were under a, a heavy abuse, a heavy burden by a by a very demonstrative government that just uh, just abused them to no end. Let's go down to verse 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. But if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those to whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So this brings us down to the point is, who is our Father? Is our Father the world? It says that the world and everything in it belongs to the, the prince of the power of the air. It's it's um, Lucifer, the Satan, the fallen one, the the one who is the deceiver of the nations, the one who brings blindness to people and, and uh, just constantly reminds them of their sins. Is that, is that our Father, or is our Father in heaven, the merciful one? Do we, do we have a picture of a Father that is merciful? If we did not have a Father growing up, then this verse doesn't, can't draw a picture for us. And it and it's a process to get through that point to realize that, that God in heaven is super merciful, super kind. He's, he's all the things that we needed to experience as a, as a child growing up from our natural father that 
that we may not have. And without that, we don't see that picture of him being that way. We think the father is either absent or in the case of my father, he wasn't there because uh, he had passed away. And so there's, there's things that affect us in our picture of our, of the father, the father in heaven. He, and if that's, that's probably something, uh, something we need to look into next in the, in our next Bible study is saying, what is the father in heaven? Like, who is he like? What, how can, how can we understand him? Because without, without that relationship with your natural father and to see that your natural father cares for you. I mean, from my understanding, at least for the few years I had my father, it seemed like he was very caring. He was very loving. He was, uh, he wondered what was best for me. He was constantly interested in, in my concern. In other words, if I wanted something bad for me, he would say, no, turn this way. If I wanted something good for me, then he would encourage me to walk in that path. Uh, we need to have a, a the proper understanding and proper picture of, of what Father in, in Heaven is like. Because if, we, uh, are we, if we're holding on to uh, unforgiveness, if we're, if we're thinking Him as someone that is, uh, is very judgmental or someone that is, uh, is, is like the negative aspects of the Father we had. I, I've, uh, I've heard people had fathers that, that called them names and insulted them and, and referred to them very, very poorly. And, and, it, and they, didn't, they didn't express to them any kindness or goodness. And so that the picture of the father has been uh, damaged significantly. So that's that's a process of forgiving. If we can forgive those that have abused us, and and have Jesus come in and and take that pain away, because he doesn't expect us to forgive based on our own willpower. He says he's given us the keys of the kingdom. In other words, he's given us the power through him. If we ask him, if I say, Father in heaven. I've been hurt. I've been offended. This person injured me. Please show me. First of all, how can I forgive them? And secondly is, you told me that I need to forgive them. Please show me how to forgive them. Give me that. Give me a picture. Give me, give me a, a realization that, I, that I, can, I can see and that I can get free from this, these emotions that flood me. And it feels like I'm getting electrocuted with pain whenever I think about those events that caused me so much emotional damage. Uh, please, Father in heaven, show me, free me, cry out, cry out to him or cry out to Jesus. If, if, you, if you can't see the Father, can you see Jesus? Can you see Jesus? He, he, he persona, personified the love of the Father. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Do we want to see the Father? We can look at what Jesus did. He says he looked upon the people and he had compassion upon them. Uh, Jesus was just walked out the compassion side of God for everyone. And uh, so that, that is another picture of the Father being so compassionate. So as we go forward, this is uh, something that we have to learn how to do. This is a, a huge commandment. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. And our society, the, the naturalness in our society has become very jaded. Uh, I notice when people don't get what they want, they become very jaded. They become uh, bitter. They'll, they'll do anything they can to get what they want. And, uh, and it can be pretty vicious if you're, in the, if you're in, the, in the spot. If you get out of the way and they pass by you, then it's, you know, it's not so bad because you're not there. But if you're standing between what well, somebody wants something and you're not willing to, to give up your ground, they're, they're going to uh, fight you. For what they want, and if it's uh, if it's evil, it's they're still going to fight you for it. It doesn't matter. So this is just one of the many keys that that we have that we can use to uh, shed ourselves from uh, being nearsighted and blinded by sin. Uh, if we have unforgiveness in ourselves, we are we're we're done for. We're we might as well just. Uh, resolve ourselves to living a mediocre life because uh, we're not going to get cleansed because we can't even see what our sins are because we're too busy judging others. And I, this is so important to me because I, 
This is something I had to struggle with for many years in my life. I had to forgive. And the emotions that come with unforgiveness are just intense. They can be just overpowering and, and, uh, and suck the life out of you. But as we choose to forgive and choose to deny ourselves, we deny ourselves the pleasure. And, it, and it's a twisted pleasure, that twisted pleasure of unforgiveness. It's like, I'm not going to forgive that person. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a twistedness in that. We've got to deny ourselves that. Deny ourselves that deception that we think we're hurting them by not forgiving them. And as we deny ourselves that and we, and we take up that cross, we, we allow those feelings of rage to die. They get nailed to the cross. They actually, they, they need to die. We need to, we need to kill uh, rage in us. We need to kill bitterness in us. These things need to, need to go to the cross. And when, as those things die, then we can actually see Jesus. We can actually begin to see God. Because it says a pure in heart will see God. So as these things are, are murdered in our life, as the evil is murdered in our life, we can begin to see God. And, and if you think you see God and you have unforgiveness in you, you're probably seeing a false God, a false spirit. It probably has a lot of pride in it, probably a lot of, oh, look at me, look at what I've done. You may be in a performance cycle where you're just constantly trying to perform to get acceptance. You may be in a, in a surrender cycle where you just surrender everything to everybody and, and they just walk all over you because you think that's what you have to do to, to be godly. And that's, that's not being godly. They didn't walk all over Jesus when he was here. Look at his life. He confronted evil when he saw it. And, uh, and the things that we thought think are evil as a religious person, he didn't even hardly make a big deal out of them. I mean, he made a big deal out of people that were judging others. As a, the woman that they caught in the very act of adultery, he made a big deal out of the people that brought her to her. He didn't make a big deal out of her sin. He just told her, go sin no more. And that's what he tells us. He tells us to go sin no more. And, uh, and he, he tells us what sin is. Sin is, is judging others. Sin is condemning others. So as we choose to forgive, we will be forgiven. And it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be poured into your lap. For whatever measure you use, it will be measured to you. So the more you can forgive, the more abundance you're going to have in your life. The more alive you're going to feel. The more joy you're going to have. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. The kingdom of God is not judgment and being judged. But it's righteousness. The righteousness of God, which is choosing to forgive. And it's peace. We're going to have God's peace in us. We're not going to be tormented by the, the constant uh, lies of the enemy and, and, and trying to figure out how to get vengeance. And then we're going to have the joy, the joy of God, the joy of God that surpasses our own under, all of our understanding. So as we uh, end this teaching for uh, uh, Matthew twenty-two twelve, let's uh, stop and 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 just look to God and ask for His for His mercy, mercy, because it says, "Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful." So we know He is merciful to us. So Father in heaven, give us the mercy. We need your mercy, and we ask for your mercy to forgive all those who have offended us. The one who uh, who called me names growing up, I, I forgive that person. I, I forgive my mother and my father for, for rejecting me, for, uh, for leaving me, for abandoning me. Uh, all the different aspects of, um, of abuse in school where, where I was bullied nonstop because of... Uh, either some physical difference I had or, or emotional difference and, and I was bullied or, or Father, forgive me for, for not saying anything, for hiding and trying to, uh, to be in the, in the shadows so that nobody would notice me so they wouldn't abuse me. Uh, forgive me, Father, for the times I was made fun of in, in front of class and, uh, and ridiculed. Uh, forgive those people that did that. There's, there's, there's so many instances in our lives in the lives of the people that will hear this message that that they need to have that forgiveness. So just ask right now, ask the Lord, is there areas where I need to forgive? And and things will pop in your mind and just start choosing to forgive them and just keep doing it until the emotion gone. If there's a huge emotion with it 
and you think you can't forgive because it's so emotionally charged, that, that is the nearsightedness and the blindness deceiving us from realizing that the body of sin is dead. And it's because it's been fed. It's been, it's been given all the nourishment it needs to be alive. And that can be put to death simply by starvation and simply by denying yourself, taking up your cross, letting the cross kill it, asking God to kill this in me, kill this bitterness in me, kill this, these intense emotions of, of revenge in me. Let it die. And let me see Jesus. Let me see his loving kindness. If I realize how much I'm forgiven, it's going to encourage me to forgive others. Thank you so much, Lord. I just pray that uh, everyone listening to this can, can walk in the, in the truth and the abundance of your love and your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.